Again, Health Research Report, 15th of February, 2013. In brief, we're going to cover four quick articles which do deserve mentioning, but probably not going to go into a lot of depth. All right, printed in the current biology and cell plus blah, press publication. Vision restored with total darkness. What they discovered is when there's no light, I mean no light, nothing bleeding through whatever it is, the brain may increase plasticity and recover from disorders such as what's called amblyopia, which I may be pronouncing improperly, but it's A-M-B-L-Y-O-P-I-A. That's 4% about the people of the United States without drug intervention. Immersion in total darkness seems to reset the visual brain to enable remarkable recovery, is what they said in the current biology, current biology of cell press publication. They also said, too, that basically they think that the darkness must be absolute to work with no stray light at any time. They don't want people doing this on their own yet because they also don't know how long they're supposed to be in complete dark. But, however, they said, quote, the researchers are still working out just how much darkness is required and for how long. Regardless, they say it is unlikely that a drug could ever adequately mimic the effects of the darkness that they've seen. Pretty hopeful information. Total darkness seems to reset a large portion of the vision process of the brain. It can help a lot of people with vision issues. Again, they're still researching. Two, vitamin C is beneficial against the common cold. That has to be one gram or more per day. Not this 60 milligram thing you find in your RDA listing on a half a glass of watered down imported chemical laced orange juice. This again came from the Cochrane Report. They looked at a bunch of studies and they looked at he heavy physical stress. And they found out, and also too, school children. One gram a day. They didn't hurt them. It's amazing. All right. Regular dose of vitamin C at one gram per day or higher have reduced the average duration of cold in adults by 8% and in children by 18%. They said, quote, that nevertheless, given the consistent effect of vitamin C and duration and severity of colds in regular supplementation studies and the safety of low cost of vitamin C, kicks the butt off of Tamiflu if you consider how long the Tamiflu uh, actually reduced the length of an illness. Did you guys ever check that out? Not very long. And that was done through phone surveys, the original study. And good luck for Roche Labs that were going to release information on Tamiflu. This is with vitamin C. You get tons of studies. So you put your faith in magic rabbit foot, Tamiflu, or you can do vitamin C. But I digress. The low cost of vitamin C authors consider it may be worthwhile for individual common cold patients to test whether the therapeutic vitamin C is beneficial for them. Big news because it's actually a small chink in the armor, I should say, where they're actually now becoming to the mission that vitamin C may yield some great benefit. Next article. Building healthy bones takes guts. Also in the journal as journal journal of cellular physiology. What they discovered is the bacteria. Lactobillus ruteri, especially when given to mice, and that's why I'm only doing it in brief because I have to see it done in humans, for four weeks restored bone density. Lactobillus ruteri. Now what happened is this, it knew work consistently in male mice, but it did not seem to be able to duplicate the study in female mice. So it's something to look on on the horizon, but however, though, lactobillus ruteri, which is known to reduce inflammation of the gut and very effective for other things, may not be a bad option if you've got to buy a probiotic in a store to buy one that has some benefits. It may at the same time, too, increase the bone density. Also, keep in mind this. If friendly bacteria that are usually found in the gut can build bone density, then by killing them off with antibiotics, that should have an an inverse effect of reducing bone density over time. So again, half the Americans suspect to have osteoporosis by 2020. What's that, seven years? All right, Journal of Cellular Physiology, Lactobillus ruteri, four weeks took results, but in mice, not humans. All right, also, mask mold toxins in food should be included in safety regulations. Big one out there. This was printed in the Chemical Research and Toxicology. What these things are, are called mycotoxins. And this is the interesting thing. Plants produce these toxins, kind of like a, um, a mold, they say. 
The colleagues explain mold grows naturally on wheat, corn, and other plants produce toxic substances known, known as or term mycotoxins. But what happens is the plants over time conjugate these mycotox mycotoxins. They're assumed not to be harmful. Uh-oh. Well, these researchers discovered that this may be even more dangerous than the threat from pesticides and insecticides. Why? Because the conjugation of the mycotoxin from getting moldy food, yeah, moldy food, which you buy readily and consume, on wheat, corn, and other substances, reverses in the gut. And this is what they said. They call them masked mycotoxins, or conjugated mycotoxins. They are not included in current safety regulations because of uncertainty what happens when people and animals eat them. Well, now they kind of do. They produce something called, and I'm probably going to bu butcher the pronunciation, deoxyninvinyl, D-E-O-X-Y-N-I-V-A-L, E-N-L-O, E-N-O-L, deoxyninvinyl, and zerolone, zerolone, otherwise E-E-A, R-A-L-E-N-O-N, otherwise known as Don and Zen. I can understand why they do the abbreviated forms. The authors say so they show for the first time that bacteria in the large intestine, not the small intestine, so food goes transverse a little further down, and people deconjugate, reverses this non-toxic substance and turns it back into the dangerous mycotoxins or unmasks Don and Zen. Their words, now they're not trying to pronounce it either releasing the original toxic forms. Again, something to look at for. We're looking at food. It printed in the Chemical Research and Toxicology. Again, this February 15th, 2013. In their words, probably a greater health concern than pesticides and insecticides, and that's saying a lot. Well, thank you very much. Once again, and I'll catch you guys, obviously, in a